The first major creed of the church is the Nicene Creed. It might come as a little bit of a surprise to us because the Apostles' Creed was one that was written earlier than the Nicene. The Apostles' Creed were not, was not written by the Apostles, even though there's 12 major statements in it. Some have the mistaken idea that each of the Apostles added one of the lines. That's not how it was. But it was called the Apostles' Creed because it was a summary of apostolic doctrine, what the Apostles taught. But the Apostles' Creed started life not as a creed, but as a teaching tool for baptism candidates. In the early church, people were uh, walked through the Apostles' Creed and they actually had to either say they affirmed it, they would say the Amen to the Apostles' Creed, or else in certain sectors of the church they were asked to memorize it before they were baptized and uh, before they went into the water or while they're in the water, depending on the temperature of the water, I guess, they were asked to recite the Apostles' Creed. And so it was a form of catechism, of instruction in the things of God for uh, baptismal candidates. Rather than just saying, do you believe? They would say, uh, well, yes, I believe. It's important to ask, what do you believe? There are uh, things we should believe that are necessary for us to be saved. We must believe certain things about Jesus, not that he is a Rhodes Scholar or that he's an educator from Texas, but that he's the Son of God, that he was uh, the Messiah, that he is the one who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, rose again from the dead. These are specifics. Jesus actually said in the Gospel of John, we haven't got to this in John's Gospel yet, but he said, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. And so he was making it clear there's certain things that have to be affirmed before we can be classed as Christians. So before baptism, the early uh, church disciples were instructed in the Apostles' Creed. And if you read it through, you notice that there are three sections, one dealing with God the Father, the other dealing with God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we come to the Nicene Creed, it's a little bit different because a lot more information is gathered here. And it's actually a creed that came to be in two different stages. The first at a place called Nicaea in 325 AD. And then uh, actually when you read the Nicene Creed that was uh, agreed upon at 325, it ended with the phrase, the Holy Spirit. And everything that followed after was uh, added in 381. And that's become the the standard one in English that we follow. Later on, there was another creed called the Athanasian Creed. And that was not written by Athanasius, who's actually one of my heroes in the faith. He stood contra mundum against the world uh, for the truth of the Trinity, the deity of Christ. Uh, It's a great story. We will not get into that. Uh, this morning or else we'll never get out of it, but I encourage you to read up about Athanasius called oftentimes Saint Athanasius. And the Athanasian Creed was called that because not that he wrote it, but really to affirm the doctrine that he bravely stood for. So that's really the uh, issue there. You'll notice that we as a church recite at times the Apostles' Creed and then the Nicene Creed as we did today. Uh, There's this third creed, the Athanasian Creed, and uh, we do not recite that because normally Reformed churches have realized it's a great document, but it's very theological. It's great to have on the wall. It's great to have a minister be able to say, I affirm it, and you can say, I've got confidence he's not going to lead me astray because he doesn't affirm it. But in worship services, it's kind of cumbersome and a little bit technical And the first two, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, are the ones that are normally recited. So uh, that's been historically the case. I was listening uh, some time back to a message by uh, Dr. J.I. Packer and uh, making uh, substantial notes. And he comes from the sector of the church known as the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, as it's called in Canada and England and elsewhere. And they have what they call the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which is a very reformed document. 
Uh, many in the Anglican Church uh, don't uh, hold to it any longer, but historically that was the case. And one of the things they do often is to recite the three creeds, as they call it, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasius Creed, and the Apostles' Creed. As I say, it came to pass in two stages. Here's where it should get a little bit interesting, because I don't want this to be a lecture. This is uh, church. This is not seminary. But I want us to understand these things, because these are important truths that you and I need to know. At the time, there was raging around the area an idea called Arianism. You may never have heard that, but I'm sure you've encountered it by means of the Jehovah's Witnesses in our own day who affirm historic Arianism. They may not know that, they may not like that, but that is indeed the case. Some of them do indeed like it and say they believe Arius was right. Arius being a chief heretic at the time, although greatly loved, very, very popular man, uh, had a lot of people following him, and it was bringing great disunity into the Roman Empire. The Emperor um, Constantine, if you know something of your history, was one who was converted. We can't really look back and see the shades of grass, uh, the greenness of the grass thousands of years ago to know exactly what was in the heart of this man. But uh, certainly he professed Christianity after seeing a vision, supposedly, whereby he saw a figure of the cross and he heard these words, In this sign conquer. And it immediately made him uh, a Christian. And rather than there being heavy, heavy persecution, immediately everything was flipped. And Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. Great, you say. Absolutely wonderful. Well, it's historically debatable whether that was a good thing. When the church went from this minority under persecution to now being the people in power, making decisions, you hear that phrase, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A lot of that could be said about the church as it gained power. These who were now uh, far from hiding as bishops in the church were now given prestige. And because there was this calamity going on in the empire whereby some were of Arius and some were following a man called Athanasius and uh, he was standing for the true faith as we understand it, the emperor wanted unity. He wanted a one message to be flowing out of the empire and known within the empire. And we don't know whether it was based on uh, right motives or not, but he did want unity. And so he invited at uh, 325, he was supposedly seeing this vision in 311. And in 325, now this convinced Christian, he said, guys, sort this out. And so at a place called Nicaea, he invited 318 bishops to come and dispute the matter. He oversaw the matter, but he was not a theologian. He recognized that. His great thing was be united. Come to a unified position. Sort it out amongst yourselves. And so they discussed this at great, great length. And at the end of it, 316 of the 318 assigned the task of uh, bringing unity 316 were able to sign what we now know as the Nicene Creed. Only two would not sign. And these were ardent followers of Arius. Now, what was Arius' position? His position, like that of Jehovah's Witnesses today, is to say that Jesus Christ is an exalted person. Today, Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was at one time Michael the Archangel and a created being. And so the followers of Arius had a catch phrase and oftentimes they would sing it almost like a soccer chant at a stadium. They would sing this. There was a time, this is being translated into English, there was a time when he was not. That doesn't really catch on in English. I mean, you're not going to get too many, uh, too high in the uh, popular music charts by such a song. There was a time when he was not. But the followers of Athanasius, believing what I believe the Bible to teach, said this. They had their own phrase. There was 
not a time when he was not. <laughs> and so both sides were uh, si singing these songs one to the other uh, in, in great hostility towards the other. They loved uh, the truth on, on the, the Athanasian side, I believe, but uh, dis dis had disregard for the error. So it was interesting. And the Arians believe that Jesus was God's top creature, that he was the first thing God ever made. I'd like us to go in our Bibles to Colossians for a moment. And I'd like us to read verse 15 onwards. There in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, and ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. He is, talking of Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now just for uh, the sake of explanation, that title, firstborn, is not referring to Him being born as a creature, but is speaking of His exaltation. The firstborn had all the rights of the family, all the inheritance, and that's the way the word is used throughout Scripture. That's another Bible study. I have an article on that, should you be interested. In fact, as we're going to go through the passage, we're going to see that He created all things, and all means all, and He didn't create Himself. Verse 16, For by Him, talking of Christ, all things were created. When we talk of the planets, when we talk of the earth, when we talk of plants, when we talk of animals, vegetables, minerals, Christ made everything. That's the claim of Scripture. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. And it affirms it again in verse 17. He is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. He's also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Here is a tremendous proclamation of the deity of Christ, the fact that Christ is the creator of all things. Now, when you come to the cults like uh, Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, and Jehovah's Witnesses, what do they do with a passage like that? Well, the Watchtower have their own Bible, and when you read it, it's alarming because uh, I heard one scholar say, it is the, the, and he stressed the word the, the, the most satanic book in the world. And you think, oh, Really? Yeah, he was not stumbling, he was not stuttering. He said it's so close to the real thing, but by believing it, you'll go to hell. That's strong language. What do they do with this? Well, you can go to the original Greek text, and you know what it says when you translate it? He created all things, and He is before all things. But when you go to the Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society uh, Bible, it inserts a word, not because it's found in the original Greek text, but because it's true according to their theology. They insert the word other, the word other. And so it says in verse 16 in the Watchtower Bible, for by him all other things were created. And it goes on, verse 17, he is before all other things, and in him all other things hold together. And so it is a uh, a fact that there is no Greek scholar who will affirm that as being true. It's just simply heresy cooked up because of the theology of what was historically called Arianism. The belief that Jesus is the top creature of God. He's awesome, he's majestic, and yet he's not to be worshipped as God. To do so would be blasphemy. He is not eternal. And anything that is not eternal is not God. And so, in the strength of that, the bishops that gathered at Nicaea went to the Scriptures and saw historically 
This was true, and biblically, which is most important, this was true. Jesus is divine. He is the creator of all things. All things were made by him. He is to be worshipped. And so, one of the things they wanted to do at Nicaea was to make a statement that those of Arius couldn't sign. You know how things can be ambiguous? Oh, you can take it one way, you can take it another way. They wanted the statement to be so strong that no Arian can say, I believe that. And they did so by the use of one word in Greek called homo ousios. And that is a word that means of one substance. Do you remember reading that in the Nicene Creed? Of one substance with the Father. That's how it's translated into English. In Greek, it's homo ousios. And what uh, the Arians could affirm would be to insert a little I, a iota in Greek, into that word to make it homoi rather than homo, homoi ousios. And doesn't it sound like we're splitting hairs? Doesn't it sound like semantics to say, well, the only difference between you guys on one side and you guys on the other is you guys are homo ousioses and you guys are homo ousioses. Come on, get a life. There are more important things. We've got to pay for our potatoes. We've got big things to deal with. And uh, you, you guys are squabbling over a little eye, but all the difference in the world can be found in the difference between homo and homoi ousios. Homo says of one substance, homoi says of like substance. He's like God. He's close to God. He's as close as you can get without being God. And yet he's not God. And Athanasius and his followers said, no, that is a false Jesus. A false Jesus who cannot save. Only the true Christ can save. That's why doctrine is so vital. Immediately you might be saying, look, you know, don't you understand? We've got real life to deal with. Well, absolutely. We do have real life to deal with. And one of the ways we deal with life is to have a relationship with the true God. And to do so, we need to know Him truly. We're not going to know everything about Him with finite minds. We grasp that. But God has revealed himself so that what he has revealed is true. When you see a mom or a dad over a, the cot of a little baby and the baby's just come, uh, just been born a few days, it's amazing to see these wonderful, educated adult people become a little bit unusual in their behavior when they lean over and smile and say, coochie, coochie, coo, or something similar. <laughs> and uh, the baby is not giving marks out of ten as to how uh, accurate their uh, translation of certain Greek words are. It, it doesn't know too much at all, but it knows whether it's loved or not, and it can sense it, and what it is experiencing in that uh, bed, that little cot, is true. The father, the daddy, is loving that little one. So is the mother. It's a beautiful scene, and we don't decry it, because it's actually very, very meaningful for the little one. It can go off to sleep knowing it's loved. Praise the Lord. It's loved truly. But the little one in the cot doesn't know trigonometry yet, doesn't know uh, the square root of nine, doesn't know a whole lot, but it knows, the little one knows father and mother loves him or her. So it is. God knows everything. He is infinite. And we can't even with our finite minds grasp what infinity looks like. If God downloaded something he knew about a subject, our minds would explode with the information. We're not able to contain it. The standard phrase is the finite cannot contain the infinite. You can't get all of the sea, which is still a finite uh, amount of water, though it's a lot. You can't get all of that in a bottle. And so with our minds, we can't grasp all there is to know about God. But what He has revealed is true, and it's meaningful. That's the point of the illustration. When the Father says, there is one God, we might not, all that, we not, might not know all that that entails with finite minds, but what we do know is true. There is only one God. 
And when we find in Scripture that one God is referred to as three persons, in other words, three divine persons are given the title of God, that's meaningful. And we can affirm it because God has revealed it. We may not know how the Trinity all works. I don't. I've been studying it for years. I can grasp something of the concept, but all I know is it's not this and it's not that, and it's hard to describe what the this is. To say that there is one what and three who's, one God and three persons, I can grasp that, but I don't fully understand it. But to go and veer from that is heresy. And so in the Nicene Creed, they wanted to affirm the deity of Christ, His full deity, His eternality. He always was. And that's what we find when we come to our Bibles. In John chapter 1, one of the many places, it says, Anarche, uh, Hologos, in the beginning was the Word. As far back as you can go in time, the Son, the Word, was with the Father. In the beginning, the Word was. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. There we have two divine persons referred to as God. He's with God and He's God. And we haven't got past the first verse. Two members of the Trinity are revealed in the opening verse of John's Gospel. So the places we see the deity of the Holy Spirit in full view. But suddenly we see the deity of the Father and the Son in the opening verse. So... Christ is of one substance in, the, in that He shares the essence of all that God is. He is God. He's not on the way to becoming God. He always was and He always will be the same. Yesterday, today and forever in His nature. Now at Nicaea, the 316 of the 318 affirmed what was written. But unlike what you might read in... Uh, certain uh, blog articles or what you might find on the internet, Constantine didn't force this concept on the church. He just said, talk until you can agree. And so he didn't force that definition on the church, but he did summon those bishops to sort the matter out. He wanted unity. Where he was spiritually, we really don't know. Now, in 381, the final version was made at the Council of Constantinople, and that's what we read in the Nicene Creed we have in our own time. Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Perhaps you've encountered Jehovah's Witnesses who might say, this concept of the Trinity was made up. No one knew of that concept until Nicaea, when Constantine forced that on the church. And everyone said, yes, sir, you're the emperor. We don't want to die well, a lot of them already died for the fact that they were uh, believing in the deity of Christ. And what's interesting historically is that a lot of the people, the bishops that showed up in 325 at Nicaea were under persecution from previous em uh, emperors and did not have some of their limbs. They'd suffered intense persecution. They were hounded by the emperor before. And now they were esteemed by Constantine, how God changes things. Let me give you a quote of some of the people out there who deny this. Dennis A. Beard, in a book called The Errors of the Trinity, says the doctrine of the Trinity did not exist until 325 AD. Now you can read that and think, well, it's in a book. It must be true. <laughs> Robert Spears, in the Unitarian Handbook, let me quote, it is an unquestionable Historical fact that the doctrine of the Trinity is a false doctrine foisted into the church to, during the 3rd and 4th centuries, which finally triumphed by the aid of persecuting emperors. All right, Dan Brown, ever heard of him? Ever heard of the Da Vinci Code? Well, although he says it's a fictional book, his uh, early remarks in the book uh, proclaims the idea that what follows is historically accurate. So he's telling what he believes is truth through the use of a story. It became a mega book sale for him and also a movie. And uh, through one of the characters in the book, he says this, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea, and it was a relatively close vote at that. Historically, it's laughable 
And people say, well, it's in a movie. Come on, it must be true. Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses. Let me quote from one of their booklets, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Quote, The testimony of the Bible and of history makes clear that the Trinity was unknown throughout biblical times and for several centuries thereafter. Again, for many years there had been much opposition on biblical grounds to the developing idea that Jesus was God. To try to solve the dispute, Roman Emperor Constantine summoned all bishops to Nicaea. Constantine's role was crucial. After two months of furious religious debate, this pagan politician intervened and decided in favor of those who said that Jesus was God. It's laughable. Except... People go to hell because they believe it. After Nicaea, debates on the subject continued for decades. Those who believed that Jesus was not equal to God even came back into time, into favor for a time. But later, Emperor Theodosius decided against them. He established the, the, the creed of the Council of Nicaea as the standard for his realm and convened the Council of Constantinople in 381 to clarify the formula. That council agreed to place the Holy Spirit on the same level as God and Christ, and for the first time, Christendom's Trinity began, began to come into focus. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they quote certain church fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Leon, uh, Tertullian, uh, Hippolytus, and Origen, but they distort what these men taught. Here's the question, I hope you're interested in this, because I find it interesting, and Sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm glad you do. Try and tell me why I should be interested. That's what I'm trying to do today. Was the doctrine of Christ's deity invented in the 4th century? Well, no, because we find it in the Scripture. In the handout on the, the Trinity that you have, there I go through uh, the biblical evidence, or some of it, regarding the Trinity. We understand clearly from the Scripture that three things are true. There's only one God. There are three eternal persons called God. And each of those persons are distinct. Understand that. You can prove those three statements very easily from Scripture. That's why the Trinity is a biblical doctrine. Often people say, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. My response is, the word Bible's not in the Bible. What are you going to do with that? Well, it is. It's on the front. Yeah, but it's not in the Bible. And someone put that on the front of that book. It wasn't there in the original writings. Moses didn't say, the Holy Bible. Genesis 1, in the beginning. That's not how it works. But the concept of the Trinity is there in the Bible. I've gone through that many times. We've got the uh, listing of scripture there for you, um, so you can read that in your own time. What I want to focus on with just a few quotes is the early church and what they said, because it's going to open your eyes, I think, to some of the things said. We understand this, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Son is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, they're distinct. So, when we go to the early church, do we have that concept in place? Well, let me start by saying this. We go to the early church not because we think that they're on the level of Scripture, but it's interesting to us because if, or rather since the Trinity is true, wouldn't we expect to find early Christians who are close in time to the apostles affirming the deity of Christ? You'd expect to find that, right? So if there is this charge that no one, nowhere ever believed in the deity of Christ till 325 AD, that doesn't look good for those who say Jesus is God. There should be evidence of it. Well, there's a lot of evidence for it. Gregory of Nyssa said this, and he affirmed Scripture this way, let inspired Scripture then be our umpire, and the vote of truth will surely be given to those whose dogmas, that means whose teachings, are found to agree with the divine words. So in other words, even in the early church, they believed what they believed because of the Scripture, not because there was any outward pressure, or because it was just popular. They wanted to believe what God said. Here's some uh, statements about the Son being divine. Ignatius of Antioch, he was 
living about 50 AD to 117. Uh, that's before 325, right? Yeah. For our God, Jesus Christ, was, according to the appointment of God, conceived by the Holy, Holy Ghost. You'll find that in his letter to Ephesians 18. Not the biblical book of Ephesians. Elsewhere, he wrote this, Every kind of magic was destroyed and every bond of wickedness disappeared. Ignorance was removed and the old kingdom abolished. God himself being manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. That's 19. 7. Ephesians 7. I didn't ask you to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 7. There isn't one. We also have as a physician the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son and Word before time began, but who afterwards also became man of Mary the Virgin. For the Word was made flesh. You might have heard of Polycarp of Smyrna. He lived 69 AD, around 69 to around 155, lived a long life. Now may, he writes, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal High Priest himself, the Son of God Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and to us with you and to all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God Jesus Christ and in his Father who raised him from the dead. I don't know if you uh, get excited over stuff like this, but I think it's exciting to see our faith affirmed in the early church. It's not scripture, but pointing to the scripture, the early church people were saying, Jesus is God. Justin Martyr, uh, Martyr was not his last name, he was martyred for his faith in Christ and became known as Justin Martyr. He lived around 100 AD to 165, again, before 325, right? Yep. And that Christ being Lord and God, the Son of God, has been demonstrated fully by what has been said. The Father of the universe has a Son, who also being the first begotten Word of God, is even God. Love it. There's more. Tatian the Syrian, 110 to 172. We do not act as fools, O Greeks, nor utter idle tales when we announce that God was born in the form of man. If he died in 172, that's before Nicaea, right? Amen. Melito of Sardis, I love this guy. He lived to around 180 AD. He that hung up the earth in space was himself hanged up. He that fixed the heavens was fixed with nails. He that bore up the earth was born up on a tree. You can tell he's a preacher. The Lord was of all was subjected to ignominy, in a naked body, God put to death in order that he might not be seen. The, luminar the luminaries, that's the stars in the heavens, turned away and the day became darkened because they slew God who hung naked on the tree. This is he who made the heaven and the earth and in the beginning, together with the Father, fashioned man. That's in the Philosopher 5. Irenaeus of Leon. Are you interested? Are you interested? I, I love this. That he is himself in his own right beyond all men who ever lived. God and Lord and King eternal. And the incarnate word proclaimed by all the prophets, the apostles and by the Spirit himself may be seen by all who have attained to even a small portion of the truth. Now the scriptures would not have testified these things of him if like others he had been a mere man. Find that in against heresies. 3, 19, 2. Again, he received testimony from all that he was, or very man, and that he was very God, from the Father, from the Spirit, from angels, from the creation itself, from men, from apostate spirits and demons. In other words, all of creation is affirming that he is very God. How many more pages of this have I got? Quite a few. Um, Okay, should be out by four. <laughs> Tertullian, Christ is also God because that which has come forth from God is at once God and the Son of God. And the 201, in his birth, God and man united. Man, if I was in any way a little bit depressed, this would, this would cure it. Praise the Lord. Hippolytus of 
wrong. You, what you do in the ancient world with some of these names, you say it fast and with authority, and people think you know what you're talking about. The Logos alone of, or the Logos alone of this God is from God Himself, wherefore, wherefore also the Logos is God, being the substance of God. Oh, that sounds like Nicaea. Yes, it does. But the guy lived from around 170 to 235, at least dying 90 years before Nicaea. You never hear of it before Nicaea. Come on, guys. Get some history under your belt. Caius of Milan, Origin of Alexander, Novation of Rome, on and on, Polycarp Moore, Justin Martyr Moore, on and on and on and on and on and on we can go. There are statement after statement affirming the full deity of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. What am I saying? The Council of Nicaea did not determine or establish the idea of Jesus being divine. It simply affirmed and defended the doctrine that had always been taught by the church going back to the time of the apostles. But the main point is, it's established in the scriptures. We don't believe this because early church fathers said it. We believe it because the Bible says it and the Bible teaches it. So modern sources like the Da Vinci Code, they claim a whole lot. But what they claim is not true. The deity of Christ is affirmed in the Word of God. It was affirmed by all Christians in the generations prior to Nicaea, unless they were Arians. And at Nicaea, Arianism was condemned as heresy. So what do we find in the Nicene Creed? Can you find it in your bulletin? Hopefully it will mean a little bit more to you now than it did a few moments before. The Nicene Creed, you'll notice 325 A.D. and 381 A.D. The first version at 325, the final version 381. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. Not G Jesus was God's top creature, His first creation. No, eternally begotten of the Father, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, never created, being of one substance, that's that phrase in Greek, homoousios, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. You see, in that statement, no Arian could affirm it. No Arian could say, I believe that who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. So when we affirm it, we're saying something that's been said from historic times. Just uh, this week, I received a response. Some of you asked, whatever happened to that pastor you reached out to about his uh, statement of faith on the website? And a few weeks ago, I said I, I wrote because you could take it either as Trinitarian doctrine or modalism, this heresy that says that God has modes of being whereby uh, He's one person, but sometimes He shows up as the Father, sometimes as the Son, sometimes as the Holy Spirit. And you wrote to Him, whatever happened? Well, apparently He lost the email, but uh, this week wrote back and said, I, I, it looks like you've written a long time ago. Sorry for the lack of response. Thank you. I was so pleased. Thank you for spelling that out to me. I'm having a word with my secretary to change the statement on our church's website. I thought, yes, making it clear. When you come to this church, we're Trinitarian. We worship one God. There will not be a false God worshipped. If I find that a supposed song was written by modalists. You know what I can do? Very little with it. I can't sing it. I can't sing it. It might be true, the statement that is made, but you can take it another way. I don't want to sing it. I want it to be so true that the truth is so known by what we sing that we're affirming what we believe when we sing so that we're not led into hell by our songs. There should be protection in our songs. And Luther understood this. He understood the gospel and he went about not only preaching and writing, but orchestrating 
songs, writing songs, hymns of the church that can be sung up and down the land of Germany that would affirm the truth of the gospel. Because if we're seeing it in the Bible, if we don't have a Bible, we're at least hearing it with our ears in the sermon. And if we're not hearing it too well, at least we can learn it by our songs. We can learn the truth. A mighty fortress is our God. Uh, written by Luther, based on Psalm 46. And if you know something of the history, it's one of many hymns that he wrote. And in Psalm 46, it talks about God being the one who is present in the time of trouble. And in Europe, when people were going to the stake for their faith because they would not deny the gospel, they were being burnt at the stake. They were let out of their houses to the center of town in chains, knowing that a fire would be started that will kill them, that will burn them. Crowds often lined the streets in many European city, cities. And sometimes there would be sympathizers to those who were about to be martyrs in the streets. And their friends, their brothers and sisters in Christ are about to be martyred. What did they do? Without any fear, they shouted, Sing the 46th! Sing the 46th! And the people who are about to die understood. They were referring to Luther's hymn based on Psalm 46, A mighty fortress is our God. And if you remember the last words of that hymn, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a song you can die to. And they often did. So when I'm singing this, oftentimes I fight back tears because I realize my brothers and sisters in Christ, for many of them, it was the last song ever uttered by their mouths. They were about to die, but they could sing it. How many of today's popular Christian songs can you die to? These Jesus is my girlfriend songs. You know what I mean by that? You can substitute the word Melissa for Jesus and the song can still be intact. I love you, Jesus. I feel so good when I'm around you. You make me feel good. I love you, love you, love you. No, these songs were crafted knowing that death was at the door. And you can die to Psalm 46 and Luther's hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark who's always faithful. He has given us all that we have and need in Christ and His kingdom is forever. What I want you to take away from this is that truth is worth fighting for. A lot of people lost a lot, lost their lives so that you and I would have creeds in our hands. It's not on the level of Scripture, but as far as it summarizes what Scripture says, it's very valuable, very valuable. It's certainly not on the level of Scripture. If we find, after diligent study, that articles in it is not true according to the Bible, let's go with the Bible, not with it. But where it summarizes what Christians believe and what the Bible actually teaches, I want to affirm it. Here's what I know. Every cultist, just about everyone, can say, I believe the Bible. I don't want a creed, I just believe the Bible. Okay, what do you believe the Bible to teach? The moment you start answering that, you're speaking a creed. I don't believe in creeds. doesn't matter, you're speaking one. You're affirming one. Who's God? The moment you start answering, you're involved in a creed. So, Christianity is not the, uh, divided between people who have creeds and people who don't. It's between people who have creeds and write them down so that they can be assessed biblically and those who just have it between their ears. But everyone's got a creed. Even atheists have a creed. I do not believe in God. That's a creed. So, it's like saying, I don't want to get involved in theology. It's impossible. You can't get past the first verse of your Bible without theology. In the beginning, that means there was one. Well, some people don't believe that. Right, yeah, but that's theology. In the beginning, God. Who's God? Well, I think, yeah, well, you're in the theology. God created, oh, there was a creation. You can't go anywhere in your Bible without finding theology. It's like going to a restaurant and saying, uh, waiter, could I have some water, but can you hold the wet? <laughs> no, the water comes with the wet, sir. 
and the wet comes with the water. So it is. You and I believe something. Let's make sure we believe the right thing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your full deity. That God became a man is the message of the gospel. We don't simply celebrate this at Christmas when we sing songs of Emmanuel, God with us. But right now we affirm Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, Father, for your love for this world in sending your Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us the revelation of Christ. Lord, may we be true like men in ancient times, like Athanasius, who said, it doesn't matter what the world does to me, I will not deny my, my Jesus, my God, the one who's come and brought salvation to me. Lord, as we recite historic creeds of the church, we do so because we believe these things are what Scripture teaches. We would submit to Scripture. We would not be over Scripture, but under Scripture, affirming Scripture. And it's those very creeds that would say exactly that. We submit to Scripture. Oftentimes that is the first article of confessions and creeds. Scripture alone is the Word of God. And we see that in the creeds. And so, Lord, as we submit to your Word, we would be those who know the truth. And the truth sets us free. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.